I never thought I'd find myself here, but hello everybody and welcome back to Neo. I say welcome back because I made a Neo video back on release. Suffice it to say, it is not my most popular work. I did my best to convey a point, that putting heavy expectations on an experience can push an unfair measuring stick of its success. Instead of evaluating how well it accomplishes its own goals, I judged it against what I wanted it to be. My review of expectations was just that, a message to check expectations at the door and try to take things as they are. Neo is not Samurai Souls. Sure, it takes a few design ideas from the Soul series, but it owes as much to Diablo as it does to FromSoft's flagship franchise. Making that comparison and expecting it to deliver the same experience was foolish on my end. Oh, and for the record, that video did a mediocre job of conveying this point, or any point at all really. It served as a half-baked review of Neo with a self-congratulatory revelation at the end. My misunderstanding of Neo's mechanics was obvious, so with the sequel on the horizon, I thought it was a perfect time to revisit the game. I took my time, did my best to grasp the many facets of Neo's RPG-heavy features, and went on a tour of duty to slay all the bosses it had to offer. And it offers a lot. I had to draw the line somewhere, so I'll be ranking main mission bosses only, a roster that still boasts 35 candidates. Though the emphasis will be on difficulty, I'll sprinkle in some thoughts on quality. I'd also ask that you keep in mind this is based solely on my own experience, and thanks to Neo's RPG elements, my ranking may differ greatly from your own. Without further ado, here are the Neo bosses ranked from easiest to hardest. Number 35, Honda Tadakatsu. The combination of complete disinterest in fighting you alongside tissue paper fortification makes what could be an engaging creative battle more of a pedestrian punchline. The level leading up to Honda had crystals providing buffs to corresponding enemies. Destroy the crystals and they crumble as well. He had the same buffed aura, so off I went crystal smashing. I thought to myself, boy I hope destroying these doesn't make him die instantly. Oh. This is basically a battle with Voldemort if he had only three Horcruxes and they were all within a 50 foot radius of him. You do get out while he goes out of his way to give absolutely zero fucks while you demolish the source of his life. In Honda's case, it releases him from the baddie's control, and sure, you can battle him in a side mission for real later, but let's not pretend this isn't something you can trivialize either. Get used to that word, trivialize, because it's the word of the day. As for Honda, he embodies it from start to finish, easily landing himself as the bottom of the bunch. Number 34, Derek the Executioner. Derek's biggest accomplishment is somehow finding a way to not be the lowest of the bottom dwellers. Round one is a bait and switch warm up, but the actual rumble doesn't have much more to offer. He's basically a less intelligent version of the basic axe wielding yokai you'll face 10,000 times in your playthrough. I say he's more stupid because his big shakeup to that formula is a charging attack so heavily telegraphed, you'd have to make an intentional effort to get hit by it. Dodging it isn't only easy, it gives you a lengthy window to smack that booty, something that does bonus damage in Neo. Though that makes this booty smacker rejoice, it trivializes any semblance a challenge Derek could offer. It's a tutorial boss, sure, but there are plenty of games that make that trope engaging. Derek has little value to offer other than providing a hearty laugh, but hey, that's better than nothing. Number 33, Ishida Mitsunari. It's over! I have the high ground! And what did you do with it? Absolutely nothing because you couldn't aim down. Then you gave it up. You fool! You tell him, Goku. I may as well have gone Super Saiyan. Just watch this. What do I even say? This guy's key broke faster than a nympho in a brothel. After that, it was combo, key pulse, repeat until dead. Once I saw how disgusting my damage was, I knew this was another curb stomp to add to a growing list you're soon to see. This stomp just had greater ripples than his peers. I'd like to note that my weapon was level 123 on a mission recommending level 120, and my character level was 92. From what I gather, gear is far more important than level, but if this is what happens when you're on par with Mitsunari, they could have given him a little bit more of... well, anything. I guess the idea was for the wind shots to debuff you, with wind status lowering attack dramatically, but he missed them all like a doofus. He does have a brief reappearance in the DLC, and I actually gave him a unique write-up thinking he was something new, but no, I just forgot he existed because he died so quickly here. I was able to see his damage on display there, but I won't pretend it took more than an attempt or two to obliterate him there either. For some reason, my first hit always devastated his key. Maybe I hit a weak spot or something and didn't realize it? I have no clue. All I really know is he died so fast that I can barely excuse having him this high on the list. Number 32, Gasha Dekuro. Neo's fights aren't the most mechanically rich overall. 
Gasha Dekuro is one of the exceptions to the rule. It's more a puzzle than a brawl centered around breaking his hands and feet for long damage openings. The resistance to this involves him stomping around like a toddler learning to walk, some fire blasts, and slamming his fist down in a few different ways. Other than the fire, all of this gives you an opening to break his limbs for a generous amount of head banging. It took three broken appendages at my damage level to finish the job, but I was told he has a big weakness to fire and the skulls surrounding the arena give free buffs that could have made it even easier easier. From a quality perspective, I love this fight. Other than his body becoming a hitbox at times, it's a fun, if simple, puzzle to solve that broke away from the all too similar design of the many bosses to come. That's for a first playthrough though. I could easily see this being a boss that ages horrendously on subsequent runs once you know the gimmick. His paltry challenge is to thank for that, a feature that lands him handily among the bottom feeders. Number 31, Kelly. The bane of William's existence was one of the game's more passive experiences. He blocks most attacks with a weird energy field, and that's about it. He takes all the punishment and key damage that goes along with it, periodically teleporting for an attempt at a sucker punch. Even when I didn't bother to dodge it, it missed, and it's not like it's hard to time a roll then get back to unleashing your beating. He gets his revenge in a trio gank later, but that's alleviated easily with use of living weapon, and it's not even a boss fight, so no brownie points here. It's easy, boring, and forgettable. A near worthless payoff with the difficulty to match. Number 30, Tachibana Munashige. Much like Honda, bootleg Genichiro puts up a much better battle in his side contest, but that's not what I'm here to rank. In the main mission, he does have a few spooky attacks on the surface, but they are ultimately his downfall. Just outspace the attack as his key wilts away from its misguided use, then run in for the punish. He'll summon a spirit doggo to charge at you, but the pillars make short work of that threat. He gets hyper armor on a few attacks if you're too aggressive as well, but there's no need. I won on autopilot and I forgot to record it, went back and it was even easier. He practically beats himself. He gets a slightly higher ranking based solely on his potential damage output if you stay too close, but it's splitting hairs since we're still in the joke end of the difficulty pool. Number 29, Giant Toad. One of the cooler visual designs in the game is about all this fight brings to the table. The battle feels like a hybrid of a large yokai with some sweeping attacks reminiscent of Spear Revenants. He'll hop and sweep all day, but that won't stop you from exploiting his ass. Literally. Many bosses in Neo let you dodge by sprinting behind them, then getting a heavy punish. This is made all the easier by an overpowered spell that I need to address. Sloth downright breaks some fights. For a variable amount of time based on each boss's resistance to it, you get to slow the enemy's speed dramatically. Magic in this game is rechargeable upon rest, it doesn't take all that long to cast, and has a high number of uses based on how you allocate your magic skill. Usually I'm an advocate for using every tool you have in the game to your advantage, but Sloth is a game changer for certain bosses. Even choosing to keep another cast in my pocket, I was still able to beat the full speed toad on my first try with no elixirs to my name. He did force me to pop two medicine, but I was still able to beat him on my first try. My damage was solid even though I was slightly under leveled, and his moveset was geared primarily toward hitting the 180 degree plane in front of him, something that was useless when I spent most of my time behind him. I really enjoyed the fight nonetheless, but it was far from challenging. Number 28, Otani Yoshigitsu. Another boss with excellent visual design. Watching him slowly float towards you is ominous, but he's all bark no bite. He's extremely weak to sloth because it's mostly dodges, flurries, and smack dab booty, but even at full speed they weren't too troublesome. I won't say they were easy to dodge because he did catch me a few times, but his damage was weirdly mediocre despite me being well under leveled for this mission. I stayed at range and fired lightning shots until slow ran out, but my damage was too unreal against him. The same ended up being true in the DLC during his reappearance. I was over 50 levels below him in terms of gear, without using sloth, devigorate and weakness talisman to debuff his attack and defense were more than enough to make up for. He's oddly passive at times allowing you room to heal, and even when he hits you, it just doesn't do enough to be any sort of threat. Number 27, Joroguma. Discount Quaylag is a staple of Souls likes, but like many, Joroguma misses the mark on being an enjoyable homage. You can avoid every attack other than her jumping slam by sprinting around a smack dab weak point for insane damage. She eventually turns into some scooty scoot shoe looking transformer with butt armor, but she transforms right back when she realizes it doesn't do any good. Outside of her jump, there's very little to worry about in this fight. She has swipes, grabs, spits pools and webs to hinder you, but none of it matters in the face of your magnetism to her backside. Though I don't completely dislike the design because it's fun squashing the bug, I can't pretend it was anything more than another speed bump. 
Number 26, Date Shigazane. Our first DLC boss is an excellent example of what many bosses boil down to with my hyper aggressive playstyle and build. Melt or be melted. His damage is massive, he's fast, and he has moves both up close and from range to keep you guessing. The balance is his size, which gives you a bigger target to hit. Despite his imposing features, my revenant farming on the way to his front door proved fruitful. I got the red demon set which added extra damage to fire, pumped all of my Amarita into Kato, which made it easy to toss a firebomb, then use the all-powerful living weapon your spirit offers, and well, you can see for yourself. I can only go on my own experience, but watching his health evaporate in a single use of living weapon was insane. With his speed and damage, I could see this guy being a real pest. But I had Kato the exterminator on speed dial ready to rid us of this vermin. Keep in mind that I ignored my advantage too in Sloth, which would have made this even easier. Even without its effects, Kato still single-handedly demolished the DLC's first offering. Number 25, Yuki Yona. Reminding you about Sloth was intentional because using it against Yukiona was my first experience with it. I'll let my first fight with her play out so you can see why I became afraid of its potential. Yuki was the wall I hit in my initial playthrough of Neo years ago that made me put the game down. I was rushing through, ignoring exploration, foregoing skill trees, and frankly playing the game in an ill-attentioned way like it deserved to be steamrolled. I got learned real good by Yuki, and it was at that point I realized that if I wasn't willing to play by the game's rules, I would never succeed. When I came back to Neo this time around, I completely immersed myself in everything it brought to the table. I couldn't believe that's all it took to obliterate her. I did this on stream, and both myself and my chat were floored at how hard she got blown back. Sloth played a large role, so I went back without it, and despite forcing me to dodge more attacks, she still fell like a sack of bricks. Look, I know JonTron basically owns Phil Swift, but I'm gonna borrow him for a minute because it feels necessary in this case. <laughs> now that's a lot of damage! As far as I can tell, she is meant to be more of a glass cannon, much like my own build. Slowing her and using consecutive blows destroys her key, and once that happens, it's full steam ahead on the beatdown. Her attacks do pack a menacing punch, she has large variety from both range and up close to deal with, but what was an endurance battle in my first damage deficient run years ago was replaced by my own forceful fisting in 2020. I'm not gonna lie, it was immensely satisfying. <laughs> I did duke it out with her on New Game Plus to see if it still worked despite being far out leveled, and obliteration was still on the menu. I'm sure for many, like myself years ago, this was likely a rough encounter, but I have to be true to my experience this time around. Yukiona may be the 10th boss from the bottom, and her damage potential is something to fear, but with the proper build, blowing through her was little more difficult than some of the jokes below her. Number 24, Saika Magoichi. At first, I thought Saika was gonna pose a much larger threat. He fires bullets, bombs, and even a bird at you. Thing is, this is irrelevant if you just bum rush him, knock him out of the air, then give him the smackdown. His shots on the ground were scary for a moment, but if you strafe, he whiffs completely. So being aggressive and minor strafing is all you really need. There is mild danger in the potential of him squeezing out bombs like bird droppings on you, but it's a small downside to his strategy that makes short work of him. I'll at least give him a little bit of credit similar to Yuki for the potential to be a threat if your dodging isn't on point, but we're still in easy territory. Number 23, Obsidian Samurai. This warrior establishes a formula that some of the game's truly challenging bosses use without the same level of terror in its delivery. The first portion of the fight is basically an axe-wielding revenant. If you fought enough revenants, you know that spacing is one of your most valuable tools. Axe wielders in particular are very slow, making them easy to take advantage of. His advantage comes in his own use of living weapon, that being the formula that I mentioned. Its use gives him high poison key regen, making it harder to trivialize him with spacing and running combos. Well, you can still do that, but you just have to do it in smaller doses. Outside of an AoE blast from his spirit and a large health pool, that's all there is to it. The cautious way I played it made it feel like a battle of attrition, but one that isn't too difficult to overcome. I absolutely loved his visual design though, and his monologue in the post-victory cutscene carried a powerful presence I felt a large portion of the game lacked. I certainly wouldn't call him tough, but we're starting to take steps toward bosses that aren't trivial or melted in an instant at least. Number 22, Katakura Shiganaga. Another fight that reminds me of a revenant, only difference being a heavy helping of ninjutsu and bombs and caltrops to add an extra layer. This was the second DLC boss I faced, and living weapon was still a force to be reckoned with here, though this guy does at least block some of my offense. That said, he's weak to the same things that most human style bosses are, particularly getting behind him during his throwing animation for a big damage window. 
His tools offer enough to put pressure on you, but we're still in a middling territory where you do have to put actual effort into claiming victory, but you'd still have to make a lot of mistakes to get stuck on a boss like Katakura. Number 21, 100 Eyes. How many times am I gonna have to teach you this lesson, old man? Big yokai bosses that leave their booty open for feasting are going to get destroyed by my aggressive playstyle. At least he spawns eyes outside himself to shoot lasers, making raw aggression a bit harder to reliably use and get a brute force victory. The eyes are very weak and do damage to his health upon defeat, but they are spread out and home in well with their lasers. Sloth makes camping behind him a breeze, but it's still easily possible without it. Just gotta keep an eye out for that DS2 turtle turn style tracking and you're all good. The resistance he puts up is evidence of the difficulty growing stronger as we go on, but still not quite to the average level. Number 20, Oda Nobunaga. The average line of Neo is reserved for Nobunaga, one of my favorite bosses in the game. He uses the living weapon mechanic to its fullest with different elemental flavors. For example, when he used Earth, he created Earth AoE fields on the ground. During fire, he disappeared for a big teleporting attack. The list goes on. The great balancing feature in his design is a sizable free damage window you get when he charges a new flavor of spirit. It was very easy to hop in, do damage for a moment, then play defensively until he rebuffed. Playing defensively is something there hasn't been much of to this point on the list, however, so props to you, Nobunaga. The design here is excellent, unique in comparison to many of the blander human counterparts, and despite the cracks that give you a noticeable advantage, it's still plenty enjoyable. That said, those cracks such as easy to dodge attacks even in such a small arena, and the free damage windows offered make it more trivial than it could be, especially when you factor in his limited health. That and the fight ends early in a cutscene. Normally I'd complain when this happens, but it's quite badass even to someone who wasn't all that invested in the narrative. Even so, I can't allocate badassery to difficulty that isn't there, landing Nobunaga at number 20, a spot that for me solidly represents the average line of Neo's boss challenge. Number 19, White Tiger. Speaking of moments that pulled me into a story I otherwise wasn't too engaged in, having my cat spirit sacrifice himself to save our group, then forcing me to fight him is a devilish twist any yokai would be proud of. He puts up a solid fight as well. 360 tail swipes, quick claws from both sides that are hard to read, ranged fire attacks, a tail smacking backflip, and even a grab to prevent booty smacking. Add in notable speed exemplified by a charge around the arena, and it can be a doozy to handle. Sloth does make it easier to an extent, but the weakness of it is that it can make dodging more difficult to time during slower attack animations. Spacing was my primary method of taking the tiger on. Since the butt was off limits, I mostly baited attacks and sprinted to the side to get damage in and avoid most of his attacks. With enough patience, you'll break down his key. If your gear and level is on par with the mission, you shouldn't have too much trouble claiming victory by that point. This was the first fight on the list that gave me trouble dodging some attacks and forced me to trade damage to stay as aggressive as I'd like to. That can be a somewhat difficult balance to strike, landing the White Tiger inside the top 20. Number 18, Great Centipede. Remembering this garbage from my first playthrough made me not too thrilled to take the beast on again. This time around, I found it less troublesome, but it still offered its share of annoyances. I have no idea how the little parts of its body running around when you hit him matters, but most of the fight is spent with a short centipede chasing you. You can't run in circles around this one like most yokai because he will make a 180 U-turn through his own body on a dime. Ignoring how unrealistic those physics are, I get it, it would trivialize the fight. Even so, let's not pretend plenty of other bosses aren't neutered in the same way. Despite this, I quickly found that squaring up against it and baiting its melee slam was the path to damage. Of course, that's between blasts of rocks, poison, and paralysis, not to mention actually getting hit by the melee. Oh yeah, and the second half where you have to regularly recharge a fan to clear a constant air of poison out of the arena. This was very much an endurance battle, and though I won on my first attempt, it was a photo finish. I have to wonder how well it maintains its difficulty after multiple fights and understanding its gimmick, but at least for my first run, its inconveniences are enough to put it slightly above the average. Number 17, Umibozu. Gravity is the true hardest boss, so this bozo gets credit for that right off the bat. There are a handful of bosses in this game that give advantages to dutiful explorers, which is a nice reward. If you light all of the torches around the level, you'll get three fire buffs, an element that feels almost necessary to do impactful damage against the oil blob. I made this fight way harder than necessary by assuming your only windows of attack were after slamming its arms down, making them vulnerable, or after its omega blast leaves its mouth gaping open. 
Apparently you can just go to town, but either way, I had some difficulty here. Mainly in that most of its attacks were nearly one shots, and it did take me a little bit to get its patterns down. Once I did, it was certainly easier, but the margin for error was present enough. Especially in the second phase when it hops into the center of the arena and summons babies to gank you. Adding that all up makes it well worth a spot near the top of today's portion of the list. But the boss with top billing for today, number 16, Oniroki. This brute climbing to the heights in the top half of Neo's bosses may surprise you, but he's a menacing force to new players. At this point, you're still quite new to the combat, and Derek is the only boss you've tangoed with. His moveset revolves between slamming his balls and spinning them in a circle. The slams are extremely easy to avoid, but you have to keep your greed in check to evade the spins. Once you get the pattern down, it's not so bad, but the tear grows once his shackles are broken. Not so much in terms of his melee output, it's mediocre even as a newbie. No, it's the accuracy with which he chucks his balls that is truly terrifying. Physics be damned. This behemoth can somehow throw a ball forward and have it beam behind himself. No matter where you are, you need to be ready to dodge. If you don't, you'll be taking a massive helping of pain. Even in some cases where you dodge perfectly, the balls are just gonna hit you anyway. This puts you on the defensive to heal, which isn't ideal when he's so trigger happy with his balls. With a balanced level of aggression, you'll eventually break his key, and that's when you can give him the business. In theory, none of this is too hard. In fact, it's downright easy once you've played the game. But in my first few attempts, Oniroki had my number more than most of the bosses on the rest of today's list combined. Even if his luster loses its shine in later fights, I'll give the yokai his due in a ranking based on my run through in 2020. But of course, that's just my opinion. Let me know what you thought of the bosses on today's list, and if I missed out on any bosses you thought deserved to be in the first half. As much as I wanted to make the Neo ranking a single video, the titans of power the second half will expand into would make this far longer than I'd like for a ranking. So we'll have to continue things in part two. Be sure to subscribe for that, and stay up to date on all the latest content from the channel. I want to thank you all for watching today, much love to you, and I'll see you in the next video.